we're going to basically continue and put one more segment into our basic series that we did on the overnight basic camp. And the reason I want to do that is because a question that I saw quite frequently, actually it was a couple, number one was, you know, what do you do about the bugs? And number two was, why aren't you carrying a first aid kit? So those kind of go hand in hand. So let's talk about the reason that I have no, what I call SAK, self-aid kit or first aid kit. Now, Every system is a development process and everything is a living document. The Pathfinder School and the Pathfinder System are the same way. We constantly evolve to make things better and to better affect our survivability with less items. And what I have found is that all of the items carried within the 10 C's, including your EDC or the things that you carry on your body every day, should effectively take care of all of your self-aid and first aid needs barring traumatic injury. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the kit that we have. We're going to talk about the things that we need to worry about and the things that we need to be able to take care of first aid wise. And then we're going to look at our kit and explain what we have in our kit that we could use for that. Because that's the importance of understanding kit mentality is what can you do with the items that you have and how multifunctional are they so that they prevent you from carrying excess items that you really don't need. Stay with me folks. Okay, so let's first talk about what we're going to have to deal with in an emergency scenario other than pain control or something that we already understand we have like an allergic reaction that causes anaphylactic shock, an insulin issue or something like that that we should already be carrying medication for to begin with. And we can carry painkillers like aspirin, and ibuprofen, things like that and that's not necessarily carrying a first aid kit. It's carrying a few pills with you that take up very little room. What we're trying to avoid now is a box of SpongeBob Band-Aids and a bunch of dressings and things like that that we really don't need in our kit. So here's what I think we need to be looking at. And again, this is an involvement of the Pathfinder system to understand how we can better utilize the 10-piece kit. We have bandaging and blood loss, broken bones, sprains and strains, bruises and abrasions, Blisters and burns, bites and stings. These are the things that we need to understand how we can address them with the kit we have. So these are the things that we're going to talk about one topic at a time using the kit that we have that we've used on our overnight camping trip. Let's look at this as if our pack is packed and we've got an emergency situation that we need to take care of. And let's look at these situations one at a time. Bandaging and blood loss, okay? In my back pocket, almost every day, I have a bandana, snot rag, whatever you want to call it. It's 100% cotton. It's a bandage. Further in my kit, I always have duct tape. Duct tape can make butterflies. Duct tape can make a bandage. Duct tape can help control bleeding as far as the tourniquet goes if necessary. I have this veil that we talked about that's made out of 100% cotton net. I can use that for a bandage. I can wad this up on top, make a pressure dressing, put this on it and tie it down. I can use this also for a tourniquet if I need to. And again, I've got that stuff to control bleeding. I've got the duct tape. So as far as controlling bleeding goes, I'm in pretty good shape without having to break out a wool blanket and cut pieces off of it or cut pieces off my clothing and things like that. All of those things make bandaging and will also take care of blood loss. As long as I understand what I need to do to stop the bleeding, I start with direct pressure. And if direct pressure doesn't stop the bleeding, then I go to elevation. If elevation doesn't stop the bleeding, then I'm going to go to suppression or something that's going to constrict an area above that wound in a pressure point or something like that that's going to restrict the blood flow and slow it down. I'm not going to go to a full-on tourniquet right off the bat. I'm going to put something on tight above the wound to try to stop the, slow the blood flow down and hope that it clots up. If it doesn't work, then I might have to go into a tourniquet situation. But all of these items will take care of that with no problem. Okay, so moving on to broken bones, sprains, and strains. Now, obviously, if you get a compound fracture, that's not something you're going to take care of very easily yourself. So you've got bigger problems than first aid at that point or self-aid. But for a possible broken bone, 
a bad sprain, a strain, you're not sure what the case may be, isolation of that is the key. We have our rubber mat that we can use. We also have duct tape. We have these implements that can be tied around things. We have cordage in our kit, and all of those things will enable us to isolate an injury. We can also use something the size of this very easily for a cravat or a head wrap or a head dressing, depending on what the issue is. But something that's three foot by three foot that's big enough to be used for a sling is very important to have within your kit because it's going to be a lot more comfortable for you than just tying string around your wrist and looping it over your head. Okay, moving on to bruises and abrasions. And we'll talk a little bit about abrasions and we'll go back into bandaging a blood loss a little bit because we're going to talk about irrigation. We're going to talk about cleaning up that wound. Obviously, we have the ability with a water bottle to cleanse a wound. All we really need to do is turn this upside down and the higher we bring it away from the wound, the more gravity is going to force that water into the wound to flush it out. We're going to need to do the same thing as far as cleaning up an abrasion. Bruises are a little bit different story. Bruises, if you have swelling, you know, if you've got some ibuprofen and things like that, that will help. If you understand some of the plants in nature, that will help. Other than that, you can do things like trying to isolate that swelling a little bit, cool it down, you know, get to a cool creek and things like that to ease the swelling a little bit. They say now that raising the limb above the heart doesn't do a whole lot for swelling. But at the same time, there are things that you can do for it, and it really isn't going to be a whole lot more than anybody else would do even with a full-on medical kit as far as a bruised area that's swollen because you don't know by looking outside that skin what the problem is. If it gets excess, then you want to isolate it just like you did with a broken bone and you go back to your broken bone sprains and strains and what you're going to do to take care of that issue. Okay, so let's talk about Okay, so let's talk about blisters and burns for a minute. And we have to first think about where the blister came from. Did the blister come from a burn? Or is the blister actually an abrasion type burn or a friction type burn that you've got on your foot from walking in a wrong pair of boots or an unbroken pair of boots or whatever the case may be. If that's the case, the best thing you can do is pop that blister and then wrap it up somehow to kind of isolate it from any further friction. If it blisters up on you, you can make a moleskin type pad out of duct tape very easily. Just layer the duct tape up, cut it out, put it over the blister or over a hot spot before it turns into a blister. If you're blister comes from a burn and you've got a third degree burn, that's a different ball game altogether. You're going to want to keep that thing moist and wet and you're going to want to keep it covered and clean. Again, we have bandaging material, we have irrigation type material. As long as we have cool liquids and we have bandaging material that we can keep soaking wet, we're going to be able to dress that burn very easily. Burns that are only first degree burns, like sunburns and things like that, again, that's just a localized pain problem for the most part and you're either going to have to rely on aspirin that you brought into your kit or some type of plant medicine for that because if you're just talking about a sunburn type burn a first degree burn where you touched a hot pot and you got a first degree burn or you got a sunburn sometimes you just got to suck that kind of stuff up you shouldn't be carrying you know a gallon of aloe in your kit in case you get a sunburn don't get a sunburn to begin with wear gloves when you're in your fire take preventative measures to avoid accidents to begin with but you have the things that you need here to take care of burns if you absolutely have to so let's talk real quick about bites and stings. Now bites and stings can be anything from bug bites that are just driving you crazy at night when you're trying to sleep. And we've talked about the smudge pot in another video in this series. You can also put things on you like 100% DEET. We are testing a product right now called Bug Dope that's made by a buddy of mine. If you want something that's more natural, it's 100% natural. You can use plants like yarrow and things like that that we talked about in past videos. If you have a bite that is swelling up on you and you're not sure what it is then you need to do something about it whether it be wrapping it with a bandage finding some type of medicinal plant that has drawing properties something astringent that will squeeze whatever's in there out you just need to keep an eye on that bite and if it starts to swell up or pus up then you may need to lance it you may need to poke it with a needle whatever the case may be to squeeze that infection out and then again cover it with a clean dressing and get it seen to when you get back now as far as stings go, you want to remove a stinger as soon as possible. If you get stung by a yellow jacket, a bee, a hornet, something like that, you're going to want to remove that, remove that stinger as quick as possible so that it's not continuing to pump venom into the wound. And you can do that by 
your sail needle, if nothing else, that you have in your 10-piece kit. Generally speaking, I carry this Huntsman Swiss Army knife, and it has a pair of tweezers on it that work really good for removing things like ticks, splinters, stingers, and the like. So if you've got something like that in your kit, you're all set. But if you don't have that, you can still remove that stuff fairly easily with just a needle if you have to. That needle is also going to do you a lot of other things as well. And we're going to go over the other items in this kit that can be used for first aid and some of their uses beyond what we've just talked about or to go along with what we just talked about. Okay, so when I'm looking at my base kit and the 10 C's, if I start at the beginning, I look at my cutting tool. What can my cutting tool do for me for first aid? Well, it's obviously my scalpel. So again, it needs to be as sharp as possible. If I've got a secondary knife, like an SAK, I'm going to preserve that blade at all costs at razor sharpness to become a scalpel if I absolutely have to have it to lance something with. And I very seldom will ever use that. I've got two blades on that thing, and I very seldom use either one. If I have to use one, I use the bigger one and save the smaller one razor sharp as a scalpel. It also has tweezers on it. So that's in my pocket. I have a bandana that's almost always in my pocket. So I've got that first aid readily available right there. I've got cordage around my neck if I have to have something extra to provide stopping of blood loss and things like that. I have the clothes on my back. Inside my kit, beyond my knife, I go to my combustion device and I look at what is that fire going to do for me. Well, number one, that fire is going to allow me to heat water up for rapid rewarming from the inside if I get a cold weather type injury. It's also going to make medicine for me if I understand plants and trees. It's going to disinfect anything that I'm going to use on my body or to poke or prod my body with, like a sail needle or like a knife blade. It will help to disinfect that. And then the other thing that I have with that fire is I have the ashes and the charcoal from that fire. Charcoal is very good to make a slurry to drink if you've eaten something that you think is poisoning your system. If you think you've gotten food poisoning or plant poisoning of some kind, then you can drink a slurry of that charcoal and you'll puke part of it up most likely, but part of it will stay in there and start to absorb those toxins. And that's important to understand that. The ashes that you have in your fire can be used for everything from deodorant to keeping you from sweating to an improvised type of rub in your hair. And those ashes are very much a buggy turn as well because they smell like smoke. You can use those ashes in your hair and things like that to help keep bugs off of you at night. So the fire is very good. Then I go down the list to the next thing, and the number three thing on my list is going to be my cover elements. Well, my cover elements, besides my wool blanket, are going to be my tarp, which I can use that if I need to to wrap up in. But I have better things than that in my kit. I've obviously got this rubber that I can use, my rubber mat that I can use for isolation or wrapping of any type of sprain, strain, or broken bone. So I have an isolation device. I also have in the front of my garbage can, I always carry a 55 gallon drum liner that I can also use to wrap things up with if I have to. And I carry this emergency space blanket that I can use, reusable, that I can use for rapid rewarming as well for a cold weather injury or something like that. That goes a little bit beyond what we talked about because that's really your first line of defense really takes care of that. I don't really look at that as first aid per se because you should be taking care of your body core temperature or CTC core temperature control is the basis of everything that you need to make sure you understand so that you don't get those types of injuries. And then of course you've got the hydration factor of your water bottle. So in our container we've got the ability to make water potable so that we can hydrate. We've got the ability to make and cook medicines if we need to. Anything from washes to that's something we're going to use for a poultice to a tea to an infusion to a decoction. All those things can be made in a water bottle and, or a nesting cup or both very easily. So that gives you a good piece of kit that you can use in your first aid. The last item is your cordage. And obviously you can use cordage for wrapping and binding of any type. I would say that duct tape is better than normal cordage. But if you absolutely had to do something to sew up a wound, which would be my last resort, I could use my sail needle and I could break down my bank line into thinner fibers, into three fibers, and use the thinnest fiber if I absolutely had to suture up a wound, which would, again would be my last resort. I've got my sail needle inside my sharpening tin, and it's just basically the sharp needle that we showed in lots and lots of videos. And that's going to allow me to be able to pick things out of wounds, to pick out a splinter, to pick out some type of stinger or anything like that. And then I've got my 
cotton material that we've already talked about many, many times so far in my kit, which is part of the 10 C's, that we can use for bandaging as well as other things. And then the last thing that we have is we have a compass in our kit. And our compass, if it has a mirror on it, it becomes part of our first aid element or our self-aid element because then we can see the cut that we get on our face. We can see the tick that's in our backside. We can see the things that we can't normally see with our eyes. If we have that mirror, it helps us to see them. And the psychological effect of that can be great, especially if you get a cut on the face of the head because those cuts tend to bleed profusely. So if I'm bleeding into my hands from my face, you know, psychologically I may think I'm dying. But if I can look in a mirror and see that cut, and it's just a hairline scratch on my cheekbone or something like that, then it's like all of a sudden, oh, it's not that big a deal. Whereas a minute ago before I could see it, I thought I was going to bleed to death. So the psychological importance of having that mirror is very great. That's why I say always have that mirror on your compass. And then the last C is your cargo tape or your duct tape. Not necessarily in that order, but that will do a lot of your bandaging, a lot of your binding, a lot of your isolation work for you. So there's really nothing that you need other than medication that you should have to carry extra other than the items already in your 10-piece kit. And that's what I want you to understand. So when people say, how come you're not carrying a first aid kit? I am carrying a first aid kit. But it's the kit that I'm already carrying. It's nothing extra. And that's the point. Okay, folks. Well, I'm Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. And I appreciate you joining me for this really quick finisher to the series on, you know, no self-aid kit, no first aid kit. And understand that the reason we're not carrying extra items is because we can already handle these miscellaneous emergency items in the field with what we're already carrying. And again, I'm not telling you not to carry medications. There's a difference to me between a first aid kit and medication. Medication is something that you need that you can't readily produce from the kit items that you already have and you can't easily produce it from the wild without a vast knowledge of plants and trees and how to do those things. So if you're carrying aspirin or ibuprofen or an EpiPen because you need it or insulins and things like that, that's a given. That's not what I would consider a first aid kit or a self-aid kit. That's a few pills. There's a big difference between that and a full-blown first aid kit full of bandages and gauze and band-aids and this and that and the other thing that you don't need. I thank you for joining me for this video. I thank you for everything you do for me, for my school, for my family, for all my Pathfinder affiliates and friends. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.